Um, the last time I spoke at uh, the Lyft conference was in 2009. Uh, Ushahidi was barely a year old. Uh, we just had a few use cases. The fiber, connect, uh, the fiber connection had not even landed in Mombasa. This is one of the important port cities and landing stations in East Africa. Uh, and mobile money was steadily growing in its trajectory, but it was a very early time. So a lot of the things that I talked about in 2009, uh, a lot has changed. So today, um, I'll be talking about what happens when barriers to technology, to innovation are lowered. And um, just to give you a bit of perspective, Africa is rather large. That pink area right there is the size of France. And it's probably about the size, it's almost the size of uh, Sudan. So uh, pardon me for using the word Africa, but uh, what I'll be talking about will be seen through the lens of the Ushahidi experience and largely from the East African tech experience. So um, looking back um, to sort of the heritage that we have, uh, when Vint Cerf and the other godfathers of the internet, as you might call them, uh, set up the internet, those the request for comment, or, or the RFC. And this was an invitation to participate and to collaborate. Um, in Kenyan culture, heritage is so important. It's sort of the bedrock for us uh, that always keeps us anchored, so we do not forget where we're coming from. Uh, but it's also something that uh, leads us to where we go. Um, one of the people that have been really encouraging, not only to Ushahidi, but others in the African tech sphere is Ethan Zuckerman of the Berkman Center. And his work is centered around bridging, um, bridging different cultures through the use of technology and through the work in Global Voices Online. And when he says that the internet has been the seminal technology of the last uh, 21st, uh, of the 21st century, uh, I have seen that in my work and I've seen that in uh, the work of others that uh, we collaborate with. So really, um, I just wanted to underscore that we do share this heritage of openness from the beginning of the open source movement with the RFC uh, forming the bedrock of it. And today, as we continue in the different open source projects of which Ushahidi is just one, you have OpenStreetMap, you have Crisis Commons, you have all these uh, um, open BSD. It's an amazing space to be in. And that is a heritage that uh, we take seriously and we hope to continue. So if we could step back again to 2009, um, we, at that time, we had just a few use cases. And what happened is uh, we had the support of different organizations, Omidyar Network and the Knight Foundation and MacArthur Foundation were some of the early uh, supporters of our work. And we ended up putting in a lot of time to setting up the open source tools that are being used today. Meanwhile, in Africa, for a long time, connecting the rest of Africa to the rest of the world uh, was not really too much of a problem. We were able to consume content, but connecting to the rest of the world from Africa was extremely expensive. Um, things changed. In 2009, when I spoke at Lyft, it was early 2009, September of that same year, the cables that you see on the screen right now brought connectivity to Africa and changed the landscape um, in a very profound way. It did that immediately, and it continues to happen uh, today as we speak. And just to give you some perspective on the cost uh, reductions, um, so in the coming years, it'll cost less than the cost of an one laptop per child for the ISP to provide uh, internet connectivity. What this means practically is before September 2009, when I tried to upload a video, I would pretty much want to bang my head on the wall because it would take forever. 
now it's not too much of an issue. It, um, as long as you can get to, uh, you can have internet access. You even have a mobile dongle that makes it easy to get online wherever you are. Um, the barriers to connection continue to be lowered, even in the rural areas. For example, the small town called Eldoret, where I'm from, there's now fiber to the home, which is being provided by a company called Jami Telecom. Jami is the Swahili word for community. And um, it's bringing connectivity in an amazing way, and this is going to change the rural landscape. It also increased the number of, at the time, we still had a lot of web 2.0 type companies. Now we're seeing even more creativity in the types of services. At first we saw a lot of, okay, uh, so there's YouTube, we're gonna have Zupi, which is like YouTube, but for South Africa, uh, and sort of services like that. But then now we're starting to see a lot more uh, services that are very uh, geared to the local, uh, to the local uh, needs, and I'll give you some examples in just a moment. Um, <clears throat> so mobile continues to play a very key role. Uh, today, nine in 10 Kenyans have mobile phones in their pockets. And just to give you some perspective, that was GSM coverage in 2006. Now, most of Kenya has GSM coverage, even all the way up to the north. So it's going to be much, very difficult to go out in the middle of nowhere and still not have an, at least an edge connection. So you can still connect even in uh, most of the remote areas of, of Kenya. Um, the cost difference has been so amazing because um, it used to cost 15 shillings to call within a network. For example, within Safaricom, which is one of the biggest uh, cell phone companies in Kenya and in East Africa. But now it's three shillings and it's much less. There's also competition in how to connect to the rest of the world because Airtel reduced the, num the, the cost. So it's cheap for my family to call me from Kenya than cheaper than for me to call them from the US, even using Skype. It's still way cheaper for them to call me than for me to call them. It's an amazing thing and enables people to connect and enables business to happen at a much um, lower cost and more efficiently. So just to give you some more perspective again on what's coming up, uh, there's still feature phones. These are um, not smartphones. They're still going to be very important and have uh, really opened up uh, the use of technology in, in, in Africa, and this will continue to be the case. In 2015, we're expecting that the growth in the smartphone market will still continue, uh, but th the current phones, the simple phones that have flashlights on them so people can, uh, you know, power is still a problem, uh, those are still going to be very, very important. Um, so one of the things that you always hear about when you hear about Africa is uh, M-Pesa or mobile money. So this is one of the things that we're really, uh, it's an innovation that uh, was actually on the network level. Um, there's still more to be done, even when it, it still does not have an application programming interface that uh, developers can hook into but its adoption has been phenomenal. More than 20% of Kenya's GDP flows through the mobile money system. It's incredible. People use it to pay for school fees. They use it to pay for their workers. In, you could be living in Nairobi and you have someone tending your farm or looking after your farm in Eldoret or somewhere else, and you can still pay them via mobile phone. And now, um, the roaming services for Safaricom have extended beyond uh, Kenya. So as a Kenyan, if I'm traveling on business, I can still pay using my mobile phone. It's quite incredible and has really transformed some of the services and will transform even government services for its citizens. Uh, pre um, electricity power is now being prepaid. So this idea of prepaying for your services has really taken hold in Kenya and in other parts of, of, um, of, of Africa. Um, so another example of how some of the innovations, the lady with the scarf, her name is Jamila, and she's part of a group called Akira Chicks. 
they created an application called M Farm, and M Farm allows um, farmers to connect with other farmers and to query very simply using SMS to 3535 to get the prices of commodities in a certain location. Um, this cuts down on uh, being uh, taken advantage of by brokers because they now know how much they can sell their produce for. This is just one of the examples of some of the things that we're seeing. It's early stage, yes, but it's very, very encouraging. On the Ushahidi front, in 2009, we had just a handful of deployments like I showed you. Important ones, but still just a handful. So to just give you a bit of an update, we've grown so much, so much as a team and as a community. And in the process, we've also learned a lot. Um, as an open source movement, uh, we've also learned that you absolutely have to uh, continue working as a team and continue working with your community. Providing the tools and making them easy to use allow people to take those tools, make them their own, and use them in ways that you could never imagine. Um, just to, to give you an example, there are so many deployments of Ushahidi now. Um, so the narrative is going away from crisis, crisis, crisis. It's about what you can do with data. When you collect that data and visualize it and connect with others, what can you do? I'll give you one quick example. We're also starting to learn that when you lower these barriers for people to use your technology, that they can come up with really um, novel solutions for their own problems. A few months ago, there was a fuel shortage in Nairobi. A few of the techies in the Kenyan community quickly fired up crowdmap.com and started texting in and putting in, um, actually they used a the hashtag, hash find fuel, and said, um, this is the location where I found fuel, it's still open, it's still working. Or I went to this other location, this particular location did not have fuel, it's not open. That sort of collective intelligence is something that we could never have foreseen and is something that we, we greatly uh, attribute to uh, the fact that we just made the tools open, available, and easy to use. With crowdmap.com, we're able to see our services jump in usage from just a handful to more than 15,000 deployments in 128 countries. That could not have happened if it was not open source. That could not have happened if it was just um, in English only. Uh, we've worked really hard to partner with others in uh, the community in Japan, in here in France, in um, Brazil, in different countries to translate the platform from English into uh, 16 various languages and the mobile applications into 17. Um, some women or some girls uh, get goosebumps from seeing David Craig uh, in uh, James Bond or some of the fancy movies. But some of us get goosebumps when we see the tools that we use get translated into these various languages. Why? Because it's very empowering. And um, the strategy that uh, included cloud computing was very, very important to us and that's what powered the growth. Uh, and when you see projects like Global Voices Online, translation and that bridging of cultures is very, very important. And that happens on the heritage and on the bedrock of open source. Um, in Africa, so this is where there's a bit of tension. Um, there's a struggle for mindshare and for spectrum. Uh, I'll start with the struggle for spectrum. In Nigeria, people have to carry around more than four phones because the networks are not reliable. So there's still a lot to be done in order to lower the costs for infrastructure and to decrease the inefficiencies that are currently in the system. Um, this image is of Facebook use around the world. It illustrates two things. One, that power is still a problem. 
the last mile problem endures. It's still something that we're dealing with in Africa, and that is a space that shows a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunity, but it's a major stumbling block to technology uh, innovation in, this, in, 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 um, in the country, uh, in, in Kenya, in East Africa, and in Africa as a whole. Uh, there's nothing that is a showstopper like a blackout. A blackout is a showstopper on many levels, industrial, technological. Uh, it's, it's really a really big problem. And there are ways around renewable energy, and it's a challenge for people to, to try and uh, think of new ideas to, uh, to go over this problem. The other problem is also the fact that it's Facebook. It's semi-open, but it's really still a walled garden. Um, Facebook use in Africa has been phenomenal. It's, uh, it's, it doubles every seven months. There's more, this, more than seven million users of Facebook in Egypt alone, more than two million in Kenya. So the problem with these um, walled gardens is, I'll just say one word, generativity. It's really hard, um, although you can build some things on top of Facebook, it's not really generative. You can't really build your business on top of Facebook. You could use it, yes, but it's not generative like the way the internet was. And this is another challenge for guys like M-Pesa and the new infrastructure that is being built around Africa. We really need to start thinking about how do we embed generative systems? How do we encourage open source use? Um, because we, that's how we truly see people using tech and making it their own. If there are closed walls around technology and access to technology, it gets much, much harder to innovate. Last but not least, we've seen this dissemination of ideas. Uh, in 2010, my colleague and co-founder Eric Herzman moved to Kenya to continue our work with Ushahidi and our vision of giving back to the local community by opening up a co-working space. And that co-working space has now grown into an incubator of sorts for local, gov uh, local uh, tech initiatives. We just concluded um, an event called Pivot 25 where we reached out to developers in Kenya to try and see what are the innovative ideas that we can build. Uh, what are the innovative services that we can provide that help meet a need and can provide the bedrock for future businesses? Can we find the next Google and the next Facebook and the next Ushahidi in, in Kenya, in East Africa, in the rest of Africa? I absolutely think we can. The only thing is we have a lot to do. But one of the things is we can always bet on the heritage of generativity and some of the lessons that we've learned from the kindred spirits on the internet. Last but not least, <clears throat> um, I just wanted to mention that uh, Africa is at a critical stage uh, to assure that that innovation is uh, encouraged and uh, pushed forward we really, really need to invest in open source communities and really encourage them to take root as an idea. We have to build on the making culture. We have the makings of it already. We're a very entrepreneurial culture. But the systems that we are setting up right now have uh, a lot to do with the future that we're creating um, right now and tomorrow. And... Uh, I think I just have one minute, so I'll uh, turn that over to Laurent. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Thanks. Juliana Rotich. Yeah, we, we have very, very little time, and I think there are many questions. Most of us don't know about the African web, and uh, we hear uh, from time to time that uh, things are happening there. And we know, we see, uh, for example, Google is running uh, frequent events in Africa because they understand it's a huge market for them. Yeah. So it, it really has some importance. But I was just wondering, um, somebody asked uh, on Twitter, um, all these services that you show earlier, uh, so I, I assume they were Kenyan web services, or African web services, are there mostly clones of American services, or are there more uh, original and, and uh, 
tailor-made for the specific needs of the market. Some are tailor-made. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's one called Elma uh, by a company called Kraft Silicon. So that one is, uh, it allows for, you can do mobile banking. So it's, it's sort of a clone, but very customized for local usage that it doesn't look too much like a clone anymore. And the interesting thing is Elma is actually being used by a Swedish company, IKEA. So uh, again, you know, you sort of see these innovations that are built for uh, Africa, but then they have global uses. And so in, in uh, Kenya, for example, is the country you know really well. Um, Facebook, Google, YouTube, all these services are very, very used, or you have some local clones, like for example, in Brazil for a long time, there was Orkut that yeah. most people were not aware of, but that was really big in Brazil. Um, for the big services like Facebook, uh, YouTube, people just use Facebook and YouTube. Uh, th there really isn't a clone, but we do have a Groupon clone called Rupu. Uh, so that's really, really interesting. Um, one of the cool things that we're seeing is um, this integration of SMS and cloud services. There's a company called PaySapal. It's sort of PayPal, but then it's integrated with mobile money. So it's kind of a clone, but then sort of like a super clone of PayPal. <laughs> So yeah, you, you, you find the main ID, but it's really adapted to the market. Absolutely. That's the point, yeah. 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 A bit what happens also in China and other countries. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank Juliana you. Juliana Rotich, ladies and gentlemen.